Okay, this is Phineas Gage, Gruesome But True Story About Brain Science, and we are completing the reading of Chapter 3. We left off on page 56, right at the top. Let's zoom in so you can see the page. <clears throat> the whole brainers are also shaken. If speech is localized on these two spots, how could someone with massive frontal lobe injuries, Phineas Gage for example, speak? And yet Dr. Harlow had said that Phineas had fully recovered. Of course, a few doctors in Boston remember much about the Gage case, and even Dr. Harlow has lost track of Phineas. I should read that again. Of course, few doctors in Boston remember much about the Gage case, and even Dr. Harlow has lost track of Phineas. By the time Dr. Harlow finds Phineas again, he's too late. After Phineas leaves for South America in 1852, Dr. Harlow's contact with the Gage family is broken. Quietly, he has wondered what became of his most celebrated patient. Then, in 1866, the year after the Civil War ends, Dr. Harlow, now running a small practice in Woburn, Massachusetts, finds an address for Hannah, Hannah Gage, in San Francisco. He writes to her, and his letter makes the long trek across America. <clears throat> Mrs. Gage is delighted to hear from the doctor who'd done so much for her son. Unfortunately, she has the sad duty to report his death six years before. Well, it's too late for an autopsy, and California is too far for a research visit. But Dr. Harlow doesn't give up. They exchange cordial letters. Mrs. Gage describes Phineas's last illness. She fills in the details of his life after he left the medical spotlight in Boston. She recalls how Phineas was extremely fond of his little nephews and nieces. Dr. Harlow notes her description of how Phineas would entertain them with the most fabulous recitals of his wonderful feats of hairbreadth escapes without any foundation except in his fantasy. Dr. Harlow concludes that Phineas had a great fondness for children, horses, and dogs, only exceeded by his attachment for his tamping iron, which was his constant companion during the remainder of his life. Finally, Dr. Harlow makes an unusual request. Explaining the importance of her son's case to science, Dr. Harlow recalls how many scoffed at Phineas when Dr. Bigelow first presented his case in Boston. Now there is a way to settle the question, Dr. Harlow explains. Would Mrs. Gage allow her son's body to be exhumed, dug up from his grave? Would she allow the skull to be removed and shipped to Massachusetts? What a request. Surely Dr. Harlow must be held in the highest regard by Hannah Gage. Why else would she consent? With her son-in-law and the mayor of San Francisco, who happened to be a physician, standing by as witnesses, Phineas's coffin is uncovered and carried to a shed. There, Dr. J.D. B. Stillman, a local surgeon, removes the skull. The huge fracture on the forehead is unmistakable. Dr. Stillman removes something else from the coffin, the tamping iron that Phineas carried everywhere, even to his grave. That December, Dr. Shattuck takes the skull and tamping iron with him when he travels east on business. Early in the, in the new year, he hands them over to an extremely grateful and very excited Dr. Harlow in Massachusetts. At last, Dr. Harlow is at liberty to tell the full story of Phineas's Gage, Phineas Gage's recovery 20 years before. He appears before the Massachusetts Medical Society in 1868 and spills the beans. This case has been cited as one of the complete as one of complete recovery without any impairment to the intellect, he says. But in truth, Phineas's personality changed drastically after the accident. Previous to his injury, though untrained in the schools, he possessed a well-balanced mind and was looked upon by those who knew him as a shrewd, smart businessman, very energetic, and persistent in executing all his plans of operation. In this regard, his mind was radically changed. 
so decidedly that his friends and acquaintances said he was no longer Gage. Phineas went from being the most efficient and capable foreman on the railroad to a man who couldn't be trusted because he couldn't get along with anyone. The new Phineas was pig-headed and stubborn one moment and wishy-washy and vague the next. I think you have been shown that the subsequent history and progress of the case only warrant us in saying that physically the recovery was quite complete says Dr. Harlow. Mentally, the recovery certainly was only partial. The new Phineas could walk, drive a team of horses, and sail away to Chile. But he had lost a vital skill. He no longer knew how to be social. Being social is a hard skill to measure. Social behavior goes beyond the ability to activate the correct muscles or decode the right spoken sounds. It's different from having manners. Manners are learned, and they differ greatly from culture to culture. Your parents teach you the right way to eat or to greet strangers, but other parents in other countries teach their children other right ways. Forks or chopsticks or fingers. There's no right way to put food in your mouth, yet all humans swallow the same way. Swallowing is automatic behavior. Using a fork is learned behavior. Eating politely in the company of others is social behavior. In your brain, Broca's area may let you speak and Wernicke's area may let you understand, but listening is also a complicated social behavior. Whether you realize it or not, you've been taught how to listen, how to make or break eye contact, how to murmur agreement or quiet objection, how to smile at the right moment or not to smile at all if the subject is grave. You also know how to show or hide your emotional reactions. You can laugh or yawn, roll your eyes upward in boredom, or open your eyes wide in delight. All of these behaviors can mean something entirely different in another culture, but all cultures have listening behavior. To act human, you must you mix emotions, actions, routines, customs, manners, words, and expressions in a predictable way. That's what Phineas seems to have lost. Bossing a railroad construction gang requires more than a loud voice. A gang has to be able to read the social behavior of the foreman. They have to know if he's angry or just joking, if his orders are reasonable or if his judgment can be trusted. He has to be able to read the social behavior of his men, too, know who are, be, are the reliable ones and who are the troublemakers. By all reports, the old Phineas was an excellent foreman. The new Phineas was not. All these changes were brought on by a hole through a specific part of his brain. In Boston, 20 years before, the central exhibit had been Phineas himself, alive and seemingly well. Now Dr. Harlow reveals the clincher, his skull. He has prepared it for inspection, carefully sawing through the bone at just above the eyebrow level so the top of the cranium can be lifted off. Now his audience can see the hole in the top of his mouth through which the rod passed. The top of Phineas's skull is an amazing sight, the doctors can see where Dr. Harlow pushed two large fragments back into place and how the edges started to regrow, unmistakable proof that Phineas survived the trauma and that his body started to heal the damage. Yet there's a visible hole in the top, a small triangular opening the size of a quarter where the iron either smashed or carried away the bone completely. The skin closed over it, for 11 years, Phineas had a real hole in his head. So at last, the true story of Phineas Gage is out in the open. The scientific debate about the brain, though, has moved on. The theories of the localizers and whole brainers are being replaced by a new experimental brain science. In time, the pinpointing of control areas will become more and more detailed. Knowledge of cells in general, and neurons in particular, 
will transform understanding of the brain. Yet the truth about Phineas poses a question that no one seems eager to answer. If there are exact locations in the brain that allow for the ability to hear or to breathe, is there a place that generates human social behavior? If that place is damaged, do you stop acting human? And that's the end of chapter 3. We'll start chapter 4 next.